Oh no, what did you do? You call that a face? Did you paint the eyes with a tank brush? I told you not to use three primary colors on one miniature. Your blending sucks. Have you learned nothing? I can't do this anymore. I'm done. I asked my viewers on Discord, do you want some feedback on your minis? And they said, yes, just be gentle. To which I replied, gentle is for the weak. I'm going in raw. To which I replied, sure, but to really improve, you want honest feedback. And because my viewers are chats, they said, hit me. Please don't be gentle. Please feel free to tear my soul apart and destroy what little confidence I have as long as you give me good advice on how to get good smiley face. We do have enthusiastic consent here. Remember that everyone who submitted wants to improve and wants honest feedback. No sugar code. Everyone that handed in a submission is a supporter of the channel, YouTube member, Patreon, Twitch subscriber. Just like last time, I'm putting it out there. If this video is getting 15,000 likes within the first month, I'll do another video like this where everyone can enter a mini, so hit the like button, it's free. I clustered these submissions together so that we can talk about gradual progression, where we are going from simpler, more straightforward tips to more complex painting theories and maybe sub changes that will improve a particular paint job. And also it makes sense to not jump from dark lining to composition of a scene back to color choice all the time. And sometimes it's good to be able to refer back to something I just explained and then build on that for the next submission. Okay, the first entry by Shadow Knight 22. Let's start with a few more of the basic things. First of all, I think you always want to make sure to get rid of mold lines, simply because if you don't get rid of the mold lines, you're going to have something like a shadow, uh, some detail where there shouldn't be a detail. It always gives the impression of this being a toy soldier more than something that's shrunken down to miniature size that could actually be alive. I know you might say this is nitpicky, but this improves miniatures a lot. Next up, you want to be really careful with the application of your metallics. Make sure that there's no spill. Sometimes we can get away with not having painted within the line, so to say, because we can later always apply a wash or some dark lining. But with metallics, it's tricky because Metallics are reflective and are really bright. It almost looks like white. So if I went in here with a color picker, we would pick up white simply because it reflects so much light. And even if we go over this with a wash or with some dark lining, we might still see those reflections and it might be hard to get rid of them completely. Another thing to do or rather not to do is using a lot of primary, a lot of chromatic colors in your color composition. For example, we have yellow, we have red, we have green. There's no blue in here, which is the third primary, but the green is very chromatic and bright. The yellow is very bright and the red just is all in your face and draws a lot of attention. And all of these colors compete for attention and you don't necessarily want that because it makes the whole miniature busy. Of course, you could make this a conscious choice. So if you want to draw attention to something like a gem, or any other detail you might want to build a story around and that you might want to draw attention to. But I'd use something more muted for uh, this detail back here. And then at the same time, use different colors for all of these pouches. You can have leather that is older, that is a bit more worn, that's from a different source. So it might be a bit darker. And also definitely try not to use yellow for uh, the fur parts here. Try to use a more muted color, like a beige or a brown uh, or even some grays. And in general, I'd suggest looking at a lot of references, you really want to capture how reality looks, at least in one way or the other. It can be very stylized, but you want to make sure that our brain doesn't say, okay, this throws me off what's going on there. So you want it to be credible, like I always say. Okay, let's move to the next entry. Bro, please take off the 90s t-shirt. Who said that? Brian, you used me for text to speech earlier. Remember, I have been watching and cannot remain silent. This is a crime to humanity. Please take it off. Wh what do you mean? This shirt is in perfect condition and it's only 28 years old. Brian is correct. Time to ditch the old fashioned clothes with their horrible fits and outdated designs. And if you watched my videos recently, you notice that I'm almost exclusively wearing these t-shirts and that's because Into the AM apparel has almost completely taken over my wardrobe. I don't even bother with shopping anywhere else anymore. Whether it's for their awesome graphic tees, everyday basic line or athletic wear. Into the AM has become my one-stop shop for men's apparel and I'm happy that they decided to sponsor this video. Their graphic tees are amazing. I love the creativity of the designs, the colors, the print quality. Their material feels amazing and their fit 
is spot on pronouncing your good sides and hiding your weak spots. That last workout has been a while ago, if you know what I mean. Their basic line has just been expanded and offers new types of shirts, hoodies and everything else you need on a daily basis. They offer a lot of packages like this one that allows you to get a massive discount on their graphic tees, which is perfect if you want to pick up some of their new arrivals. Or check out their new basic packs and on top of that, you can save an extra 10% off of your purchase if you're using my link in the description. So don't hesitate, follow my link, grab some of these amazing designs or stock up on some basic apparel that you can wear every day. Make sure to use my discount code, that's T-R-O-V, on checkout for that extra 10% off on everything they offer in their store. So I know this is probably supposed to be a rather muted color scheme, but it might be a bit too subdued. So you want to create some variation within all of the shapes you have. So that means you will probably want to add a couple of highlights to the higher up areas. Uh, as we can see, all of this up here is just as dark as this down here. So maybe add a bit more chromatic green to your highlights and make it brighter as a whole. And then as it comes down here, everything would catch less light and maybe it's even getting dragged through the mud. So you can have some variation there. So making it darker, adding a bit more of that ground color maybe, so a bit more of a brownish tone. And you can even dry brush some highlights on the material you use up here. Another thing is the gold and the metallics in general. You want to apply a wash so that darker color creeps into these recesses and makes it darker so that your higher up areas that are not stained by the wash are your first highlights and then build on that. So you definitely want to yeah, just slap an edge highlight on all of these areas. And then the OSL that you tried here, definitely make sure that the, the inner area is brighter than the outer part. So you can definitely extend that green a bit further outwards, but then make sure that there is some green, some brighter green, even maybe almost white in the middle. Aiton did submit this ultramarine. Um, one problem that I have is that the, the non-metallic metal looks really similar to the blue armor. So maybe think about how you could switch that up. Um, a suggestion would be to maybe make this a bit more turquoise than primary blue. And make sure that your gradients go from really dark to bright. Either break the surface up into two gradients. So maybe you have a highlight here on this side and then it goes dark and then it, down here you have that highlight again. Or just keep that brighter area a bit longer. So a really big, whitish highlight here and then extend the brighter blues down a bit more and only then start going into black. In general, the piece needs more definition. Edge highlights are sometimes frowned upon if you only do edge highlights. At the same time, if you only do volumetric lights, like if you only define the shapes and then you don't do edge highlights, um, it's the same problem. There's something missing. All of these panels, they should receive edge highlights because even if we look at references, if you look at a cylinder, you will have that bright edge highlight and then the way that the shape reflects the light in this line pattern running down vertically, you also, you need both. You need the edge highlight and that big highlight to make the miniature understandable because, for example, this plate up here, the hip guard and this part of the leg, they just blend together because there's no separation. For the reds, uh, it's always tricky if people are using satin or even gloss paints. I recommend either getting paints that are not glossy, so matte paints, uh, new game colors, or AK Interactive. But if you have a lot of paints already and you don't want to switch, you don't want to fork out the money, that's perfectly fine. Just invest into um, some, some matte varnish, in my opinion, and a cheap airbrush. You don't have to use the best model, you don't have to use an Infinity or any other expensive airbrush, but just a cheap airbrush with a cheap compressor that uh, you can use to tone down all of the shine because, you know, this highlight, for example, is not painted uh, and it messes with what is painted. And I would just lean more into, uh, into black um, shadows. So keep this orange-ish, yellowish highlight confined. That's fine. Just keep it there to um, increase the contrast as far as highlighting goes, but you can go all the way to black on shading reds. Yeah, this, this creates a lot of depth in this scale. Uh, Patekar the Beast submitted this zombie dragon. Pictures are also not that good. 
Um, I still kept it in because there's a few things to talk about. The approach of having a senator light uh, with spraying the mini black and then white from top is relatively effective. Of course, up close, we get these artifacts if it's not done with a really thinned uh, ink. That's the white highlights from above. You, you have this texturing. So either you you try to get an ink that doesn't um, have these, these speckling effects, or you just uh, say, yeah, I'm fine with that. So that's the two options. One remark I have about this is even though you have a lot of pre-shading already in place, I would just try to increase some of those highlights a bit more. So maybe now you have your colors established, but for example, let's just pick that out. On the wings, you could play into all of these line patterns that are sculpted and just, yeah, paint a few more highlights. Like maybe pick out that apex point because all of these elements between the fingers they're curved, so we can maybe do that. Just pick out this middle ridge. I'm not just go like this and really just focus on, on all of these lines. And you could do the same thing for all of the elements. Um, for example, here, just pronouncing these edge highlights a lot more like this. It's a bit overdone, but you get the idea. Just adding some highlights on top of this. Don't just run with what contrast the initial technique gives you picking out some of these edges sure it's extra work but it, it really pays off in the end because now you have a guideline for what should be highlighted and what is in shadows and now just build on on that foundation yeah so if you want to improve and that's why we're here for i would recommend moving away from dry brushing again there's nothing wrong with dry brushing if you want uh, quicker results, but it's just a texture that always shows. And I know that people will say, what about Bohan? I never know how to pronounce that, but that man is a different breed. So he has figured it out to the T, right? But if you don't know that technique in and out, a dry brushing will always look like dry brushing. It's, it's fine to dry brush, but usually you want to add something on top. So if you dry brush that initial gradient, you kind of want to paint over it maybe with opaque layers, like making this here a bit more consistent so like you can use this as an initial gradient from the darker green to the brighter green but then maybe make sure that this layer up here is more consistent uh like more of a consistent highlight color like this so that you get rid of some of that um, darker color and then on top of that you can dry brush another brighter color again so just go over this with the um, with your dry brush. So that's going to be a tiny bit tricky to replicate, right? So if you dry brush this on top and work with the texture, that can look good. I'm 100% convinced. Yeah, don't just dry brush and expect um, it to look anything else than dry brush. Yeah, so something like this. It's kind of hard to replicate on digital. But yeah, that way you keep the texture and at the same time, it looks like you have more control over what you're painting. The rest is relatively simple adding a more contrast, like for example here, either with a darker um, green or with some color variations, some red, leaning more into that. And maybe also here on the front part, like this. And just making sure that it doesn't look too, um, too similar in, in all areas. So they did that up here. This is what I'm talking about. So leaning more into that, having uh, different angles with different shades, that looks really interesting. So the purple back here, I used uh, brown, but purple is a fair color to use in this. Yeah, so that, that would be my recommendation for this. PPC submitted this core and blood bound. And besides the basic things to keep in mind, like having good separation between all of the parts. So for example, here, you would still want a darker line. Although I think you might have just forgotten that particular spot because there's good separation here in the axe and between most of the other parts. I think the main problem here is uh, having used a lot of washes. And even though you get a good initial result, I think it needs some cleaning up. So uh, the reds down here, they look kind of samey. So you want a few highlights 
in this part and then also some shading probably. And you definitely want some uh, cleanup on the skin. So you should probably pick up a mid zone for the skin and go over all of these parts that are uh, kind of rough. And also it's a good way to clean up the spill up here and just uh, work on that volumetric highlighting. Just um, yeah, analyze all of the shapes, whether it's a biceps or a finger or the feet and just work on these highlights. Like the, the biceps is probably a bit of a round cylinder and we need to push up the highlights all the way towards that wonky deltoid. And then also the scar needs some love, so you can keep that initial red um, scar tissue and just highlight it up. You can use the same color that you use for the skin or maybe a variant of the red. It's up to you, but just make sure that you have a couple more highlights in there. The metallics, I think, have a good base. You just need to refine it a bit. So there's some good shadows on there. Um, the gold has a nice color. Now you just need to pick out some of the edges maybe make some areas a bit darker and some a bit brighter. So that it looks like there's actual reflections on the steel. But now it looks a bit too similar across all of the areas. So maybe add a few shadows and a few highlights and definitely add some edge highlights where the light catches on and reflects a lot more. Another thing to do is to make the blacks a bit more interesting. Like right now they look very similar in all areas so you can kind of follow the the natural light so up here um, I would pick out some apex points always try to have a separation again to the skin and then uh, yeah anything that's like an edge that's facing out have a bit of a highlight in there I'm going a bit more extreme but just to illustrate what I mean you can of course have variations uh, going from dark uh, way brighter here now to to make a point so um, this kind of apex point here because there's a curve uh, of the strain of hair it's coming up and then it's uh, bending downwards again then we can highlight this and this is kind of parallel to that so it's something like this maybe just try to to pick out areas that come up, form an apex or curve down and form an inverted apex uh, and try to, to place some light on these areas. The hair usually has a bit of an easy fix if you just apply a wash like you did here over a bright color. You don't have these problems, but if you start from black or a really dark color where you cannot apply a wash to make it darker, you need to bring back some of these highlights like we did up here. Yeah, generally everything else looks like it needs a bit more of an edge highlight. So for the braces, for example, you can just pick out these areas, just place like a dot or two uh, of pigment up here and everything changes already. Just bringing a bit of that contrast in there, picking out some of the details just makes all the difference. Maybe the hair a tiny bit more, some areas. Just makes everything a tiny bit brighter and a bit more interesting. Uh, Stefanius submitted this avatar. Yeah, so I have a video about how to, to do lava and um, lava weapons. I'd recommend watching that again. The thing is, the execution of the fire is a bit inconsistent. So you, you want more transitions, even though you want the inside here to be really bright. Uh, what I'd probably do is paint the bit of white in there so that you have that really bright shine from within but then you also need some orange on these transitional areas so you go from from yellow to red right away and you have some orange in there but also need that there and then you can even go to black in some areas right then it looks like it's cracked lava and the outside is kind of cool but the inside is very hot and glowing and then the weapon, uh, yeah, is has a bit of a problem too. Here, I would recommend uh, maybe also doing the lava effect. So decide whether or not you want the inside to be hot or the inside to be cool. And then if the, the inside is hot, have the, the edges go darker and the outsides go darker and even towards black like I did in that video. Or if you want to do it the other way around, have the insides dark and then have these edges be more uh, towards orange and 
yellow and maybe even white in some areas so that you can communicate that glow from within. But yeah, if you have something that's white, uh, some white cloth, you would almost have to add OSL. So white is a really reflective color, obviously. So you would have to add some of the red and, and orange to be reflected in there. Uh, I almost feel like you need more expression on the, uh, the gemstones, some more highlights, and probably even some, some red reflecting in there, right? For the same reasons, reflective material, and then around it, you have all these flames, and, uh, lava, and intense light. Uh, Phobos submitted the Gandalf, and I think while it's not badly painted, it suffers a bit from thinking in separate items. So the staff is a separate item, the head is a separate item, the face, the beard, and all of the cloak. So we have a relatively chromatic blue for the head and um, some dark brown for the staff and reddish brown shadows for the beard and beige highlights and almost yellow highlights. I would have tried to make everything a bit more coherent, maybe starting a lot of the segments, a lot of the elements with a relatively similar base color and then using different highlight colors to distinguish the parts a bit more. That would make everything more coherent. So for example, if you started the hat and the coat um, from the same color and then moved more into gray highlights on, on the coat, on the clothing, and on the hat, you went for more bluish highlights, you would still have that coherency. Same for the beard, if you did the same base color or a similar base color, and then just moved into these more beige highlights instead of the, the brown tones, it could have looked a bit more interesting. Again, it's not bad, it just is a bit reminiscent of these pre-painted miniatures where they do that, they don't care about color theory at all, they just use whatever thing fits as a hair color or as a color for uh, wood and so on. And base would have benefited from some sort of color element maybe. I know that this is supposed to be underground, relatively regular stone, maybe carved stone, um, some ruins or whatever. But I think if you did a bit of a light effect, you know, would have looked interesting just to maybe use an airbrush from below or even just dry brush a bit of red on and then as we go further away uh, add a bit more yellow to to the edges uh, so just a slight light effect or yeah maybe some dwarven equipment maybe some swords maybe a helmet or something like that it's looking really monochromatic so just something to break up the monotony i have our miniatures a bit this ultramarine. It's a relatively solid heavy metal paint job. Not much to add there. Uh, one thing maybe when you do the old glowy eyes, you have to be careful with the rim light. The idea where this comes from is a 2D illustration. Obviously in 2D we can add these glow effects everywhere because it's a flat canvas. So we would not be able to paint this on the miniature because there's just negative space here. <laughs> Uh, what we can do is we can add a glow over here, like reflecting. But yeah, if we tried to copy this effect, we could add color here, like up here and down here. But the problem is if you overdo it, like in this piece, it looks like a, a weird mask. What you want to do is have the eyes be the brightest part and then think about what are areas adjacent. So if that orb inside is glowing and the top of the helmet, so the forehead of the helmet is hanging over that, how can it um, reflect up here? It can only reflect here and that's it. Again, this is trying to simulate that glowing effect, but it's overdone. This is a bit of a better example where first of all the colors of the rest of the space marine are muted it's really dark colors and this is what i mean you you can have opposite areas reflect the light the source is super bright it's the brightest area and then you have this slight glow around it but it's nowhere as bright as this inner part the source is the brightest part and the rest gets darker and obviously works a lot better with darker minis because that's the thing, if you have a really bright space marine out in daylight, you would probably not get this effect. But if you did the surrounding area, the rest of the space marine, the rest of your miniature dark, it feels like it's walking in the dark and then you have the glowing eyes and then you can have this 
affect Shan a bit more. I would not try to force it on something bright like this. Next up, we have Starkey with a Chaos Engine. And the first thing that pops out is again, some of that separation uh, between the single elements, between the metallics, the reds, for example. There's some of that going on here. I don't know why you haven't done it here, but I'd recommend doing the same thing you did here, also on all of the other elements. Try to make the, the red surfaces a bit more interesting. I'd recommend doing some sponge chipping, for example, or you could even use the sponge to stipple on a few additional highlights. In any case, I would try to create some texture here on these large and somehow flat and boring surfaces. Another thing that's not super convincing is the fire that burns in these stacks. So you move from a color that's really dark on the inside towards a brighter color on the outside. And you would probably expect the opposite. So you would expect it to be really hot and bright on the inside. And then the further you go to the outside, everything should cool down a bit more and become more red. More like this, so really bright, like this. And you can leave some of the red around on the white to just show that glow and an inside glow. Uh, everything cooling off more towards the outside, being in there. And I'd probably treat all of these as, the, as individual things. And maybe some of these that are closer towards the bottom or the inside of the engine where it's super hot, I'd make these even brighter. So for example, down here. And then as we go up, everything can become a bit darker. So in this case, we have maybe more orange up here. And then additionally, I would definitely have some of the light bleed over so that it looks like there's some glow going on. So we would have some red up here. And especially if you have areas that are in shadow, I would definitely try to do some glow there and anything that's adjacent to each other where it would be shining a glow on another surface. So over here, for example, as the fire is hotter, I would also try to put a couple of highlights in there. Like this, you know, further down, we have these hotter glowing parts. They would be brighter. Next up, we have B2S project. They have a lot of concepts in here, like chipping and weathering. But I think the problem is it looks a bit out of scale. So for example, with this chipping, they have a lower line here where the lower edge where the paint is still intact there's an edge that would reflect a lot of light and they tried to do that, but it's a tiny bit too thick. In this scale, it would be really tiny, just a sliver of that brighter yellow would be visible and not this wide area. Also over here, they kind of did it in the wrong area because you want to have this line show on the lower parts, right? Everything that faces up. Also the flakes look kind of large, so I would recommend not painting it with a brush. It takes a lot of practice to be able to do this with a brush and making it really credible. So what you can do is you can run the broad side of your brush across the edge, for example, here, uh, take it off and back on as you run it across. It always looks off if uh, the chips are not on areas of wear and tear, which means edges in the lower parts, which they did here. But again, these large flakes just kind of look out of scale. And, and on my chipping video that I did back in the days, I got a lot of criticism because yeah, a lot of these larger flakes do show on very weathered, very abandoned uh, gear. But I think these are rather fringe cases. So usually it's a bit more credible to have these microchips on there where stuff would hit. And you can have some of these larger flakes where maybe the dreadnought was hit with a shell and all of that, but I would also add these really tiny flakes and chips on the edges. Like I said, run your brush across the edge a bit more and add more microchips with a sponge instead of with the brush. Don't do these freehand chips. Use a tool to do that. And then we have to talk about the weathering. It's perfectly fine to have water collect here in these chips and then as the water runs off, it washes down rust particles and then that stains the, the yellow a bit. I always recommend that you at least try out oil uh, paints for this because you can use um, thinner to, to create more credible streaks. And if the streak is too wide, you can narrow it down by running the brush with the thinner across it and then wiping it away. So you have a bit more time to work on these streaks with oil washes. It's a bit more tricky with acrylics because you really have to 
nail the application. I'd recommend maybe using more opaque color and trying to paint thinner lines and then making the lines a bit wider with maybe a more diluted um, glazing consistency. But the problem that I have is when you look at these a bit more in depth, you can see that the inner parts are kind of washed out. So there's some yellow here and then you have like coffee staining on the outside and that's typically not what happens. So, so what happens is you would have a a thick streak on the inside, really orange and thick streak. You can see it over here. There's uh, a lot of coffee staining going on. And then towards the outside, it fades out a bit, simply because down the middle, you have some more staining because there is more water running down this way. And then the spill to the side, there's usually less layers covering that. So you have a bit of a gradient towards the outside. Tried using a filter down here. Filter is usually something that you apply over a lot of surface. It could be a wash, could be an oil wash, could be an enamel wash. But you kind of want to keep that consistent. So we have a lot of coffee staining here. So you don't want that necessarily while applying a filter, while making the lower parts of the dread darker, which is a thing that would happen, right? So you would get brighter colors up here just because it's hit more by sunlight and then darker areas down here, simply because there's not that much light hitting. But on top of that, it's closer to the ground and you have a lot of that soot. I know you probably tried to play with color consistency and the paint maybe not looking super regular, but a lot of these areas look like you didn't apply enough paint. So maybe you applied one paint layer and you still have the base coat shining through, like if it was a black base coat that's still shining through in these areas. And coming back to what we said earlier, that kind of portrays the scale. So you want to find some method that makes it look like there's actual paint that was consistent once, but due to weather or mechanical wear, just got worn down. And you can do that by applying a solid layer and then uh, some filter or some wash to stain it, to make it darker in some areas, and then reapplying some of the base color with a sponge, just chipping on the color and just sponging on the color. And that creates a more credible color surface that has been worn down by the environment. I definitely lean a bit more into these washes that you did here, where you have stains around the rivets. So that looks really good up here. You didn't do that as much down here. I think you can do that a bit more consistently. And then another thing that you can do is try making the panels up here. So everything that's facing upwards a bit brighter. So this would be a bright panel, this, this, this. And then as it faces downwards or more to the front, uh, the angle changes and it's not uh, perpendicular to the sunlight, but it's facing forward. So it would not catch as much sunlight as these other plates. And that would create, again, a bit more of a natural feeling of this thing being something huge that's catching a lot of light from the top and then having a lot of angles that are facing away from the sun or not directly facing the sun where you would have more shadow simply because it's so large. Yeah, definitely lean more into edge highlights. So I would expect a really, really large edge highlight over here. So right here, that's facing up. You would have an edge highlight that's accumulating you would have an edge highlight where you have an apex point of light reflecting up here. And also same thing here. Any, any edge that faces up, same here and same here. Yeah, just make those a bit more bright. Andy the Brumax submitted this towel battle suit. And this is a good example of what we have been talking about. So for a gaming piece, I think maybe you could go even harder on the edge highlights. But when you want to start moving beyond tabletop, you will have to treat the surface is a bit different. So like we said, you want to trick the viewer's eye into thinking this is something large. And that means, again, copying how light would behave on a large surface like this. I would start by making every surface that faces up brighter. So for example, this up here and also uh, this. And also the front part, I would paint a bit of an apex highlight. And same goes for the reds. So every red surface that faces up, I would make that a bit brighter. And obviously, all the edges that face up, I would also make brighter. So on the foot down here, it would look uh, a bit like this. And further up you go, I would also make all of these highlights a bit brighter. 
This is something we generally call volumetric highlighting, where we take into account where the highlight is coming from, but also what the shape is that the highlight is uh, placed on or reflecting on. So if it's a cylinder, you will have a horizontal line in any case. If it's a sphere, depending on what the surface is made of, you're going to have a bit more of a confined specular highlight if it's really reflective. If it's more dull of a surface, you will have a larger highlight, but it's still in that general area. So learning about this, about how shapes look, how surfaces work, this will help you create more credible uh, light situations. I have a video on volumetric highlighting if you want to look that up on my channel. And in particular, I have a video on tau suits where I do exactly that for all of these different shapes and how I usually uh, solve the puzzle that this becomes. Because what happens is you will have this bright highlight over here. So this one up here, and then how do you treat the other one? Because this there's a change in angle, so it should be darker, but it should still be somewhat brighter. And also the question is, uh, how do we make it interesting? So usually what I do is I try to stay credible with my highlights, but a rule of cool always trumps everything. So I'm going to try to, to create an interesting gradient on all of these other parts where I will leave a bit of a dark area up here and then do a highlight towards this front edge and then do the same thing for uh, the wider area. So here we will have a bright highlight again. And then for this large surface, I'll do something like this. That is really similar. That way I still have an interesting surface even though it might not be exactly the way that it behaves in reality. That's why I say credible, and then we can always add on top of that. So the chipping didn't look too bad. I feel like it's a bit inconsistent. Again, we talked about it earlier. You would expect it to be more on the edges. Uh, so a bit more consistent placement of these highlights would be good, I think. And right now it looks a bit random. So where's this one coming from? And then you have a large one here. And there's a lot of uh, particularly small ones here where you would still expect um, some of them, you know, running down here on the edges and especially on these more exposed parts here in the front. One last thing that I would like to mention is it's kind of tricky to do good bases. In my opinion, bases are a big thing moving away from tabletop standard towards a more, more ambitious way to paint. So you can use all of these elements. So you can use cork, you can use these tufts, you can use these flowers. But the thing is you need to look a bit more at how nature works. Again, we are trying to get into the brain of our viewer and making them think like they're looking at something that could exist. Uh, we don't want to look at it at this scene and have any element take us out of the illusion. Right now, we kind of know that there's some cork here. We don't necessarily think that is stone. And for this particular problem, I think the solution right away is not using these small cork plates. Uh, try to get thicker plates that you can break up. Um, you're fine with using cork, just trying to create the more natural stone texture. Because uh, this, at the most, looks like a really broken up concrete slab, but it certainly doesn't look like stone. So even using these cork plates, you can still try to rip off most of that upper layer so that you have less of a straight uh, surface so that it's broken up a bit more. On this one back here, it's more evident. So try to do that. And then on top of that, you can do gray stones. It's perfectly fine. Personally, I'll just try to not use gray as a base color. Maybe you can use a dark brown or probably better dark green or something like that and then go over it with some grays and even if you start off gray always apply washes of maybe you know whatever color you use for the sand and then add some variety add some greens maybe add some of these moss flocks on top uh, and then extend it out uh, maybe if it's a green moss part then extend out the green more on these uh, rock parts and then also try adding more of these elements, like maybe some broken off parts of the stone onto the rest of the sand, right? Because now you have rock, then you have sand, another rock, right? So 
this is usually not how nature works. Like there's going to be some erosion, parts breaking off, and then they're just lying there next to it, and then they're getting covered by sand. Just looking at references is a really good thing here. And then we have other elements that are just, you know, tufts. And they're placed there and then that's it. So you want to treat those. We talked about it a bit earlier. You definitely want to dry brush them. If nothing else, uh, simply to add some variety. And then, you know, even on, on grass, you will have highlights um, where the sun hits. And adding that is going to make it more credible. But you also kind of want to make sure that you integrate the tufts with the rest of the sand. So just applying a wash. Ideally, you do this with an airbrush because then it looks a lot more natural. But even just washing it, you know, down here, just applying washes of gray is going to look pretty good. Uh, just applying washes of this brown color is going to look pretty good. And additionally, I would try breaking up these tufts a bit more. So maybe you have a larger tuft here and then you break another one up and you place parts of that broken up tuft here and then more away here and then maybe he's stepping on one of these tufts just on top of everything making sure that your miniature on the base interacts with the base and in general that's a theme for bases that you should remember so epicbasing.com not sponsored but they have a really good grasp of this so what they do is they create something large so something like this, that would be the main feature, the, the main rock, the mother rock, so to say. And then they would create smaller rocks of that same type. Just like we said, stuff that uh, rubble that broke off and then just rolled uh, a few inches away and just stayed there. And you're placing these in between all of the other rocks. That is really credible. And then they have that concept of filler that usually is... Um, some plants or branches or anything you can think of. And then you can place that in between. And in between of that, I would place the tufts, for example. Of course, you don't have to buy their stuff. You can just repeat the same pattern with the more basic uh, basing elements that we have, like cork and so on. Next up, we have this Iron Hands Space Marine by Death Rituals. I really like this part down here with the texture and it also has a good contrast. A balance with going from really dark almost black to yeah almost white and uh, it looks really interesting and then i like how the skulls look uh, distinct from that even though they're both like this beige white and then we have another color hue up here so i think uh, this is a, a really good solution for how to paint really similar colors in a different way so that they don't look too samey and then the purity seals also look different from all of the rest. The black armor does look good too. It has good contrast, really bright edge highlights. So I would definitely keep the style with the distinct edge highlights and the overall uh, more or less non-existent volumetric highlights. I think we can find a bit of a middle ground by maybe taking a really, really dark black probably have to use some glossy black to achieve that effect because a matte black is always going to look uh, slightly more gray than a satin one. So we have a hint of what I mean here. There's a really dark black outline before we hit the edge highlights. I think we can lean into that a bit. I, I also do like how the bone white is shaded a lot more in the lower parts, by the way. So we have more black here and a bit less black, uh, more of a brighter brown up here. Looks really good. It's something to keep in mind. You don't have to apply the same shadow color over the length or uh, the height of a feature that you're painting. Okay, to illustrate what I mean, maybe we can start here. I would do a bit of a volumetric highlighting where this part is a cylinder and it curves out. And we just tone down the outer parts a tiny bit so we have to fix this and blend this together a bit but we have this middle highlight expressed a bit more yeah i think that can that can look good so just keeping the overall feeling of not too many highlights on the individual shapes so in a way we would highlight the knee pad for example like this where we would just add rays on, on top here. 
and then go in brighter and add more of a specular highlight. I think this can still look good and then you can add the, the little scratches on top. I'm just making these a bit more pronounced. Can still work, but you don't necessarily have to do it. So I think just shading down certain panels like you did here, I think that's that's gonna look uh, amazing. Again, I don't always want to impose my style on everything I critique. I think it's still good to to find your own style and, and just work with that. And I think this definitely works. Just leaning into that a bit more in some areas. So Gem Toast was following my Ogre at Mimidon masterclass. I like how the base turned out. I think you could go even further with the red on the OSL. Uh, it will make everything a tiny bit more interesting. So just anywhere to up here where the angle changes, where the slope kind of comes forward like this. Also, I think you could lean a bit more into the volumetric highlighting. If you want to learn more about this, this masterclass is on YouTube. You can just go to my channel and check it out. Also, I think the face might be a tiny bit too dark as far as these wrinkles go. Usually wrinkles on a forehead are not that deep. I mean, obviously you see them when I do this, but when we go into miniature scale, this is usually non-existent. So they should not be as dark as this. I use washes a lot. And sometimes washes will do this, right? They will go on and pull in the recesses and then you will still have some coffee staining. The thing is you kind of want to apply them in a more controlled way and you don't want to slap them on and then leave them to dry and not babysit them a bit. Either you go more glaze consistency and apply two or three washes in a more controlled way. You push the pigment to where you want it to rest and then leave it dry. A hairdryer usually speeds things up. And then at the same time, you can use the transparency that they provide to create your gradients. Or you could just use regular paints, regular acrylics. That has the effect that you can um, harness the matteness of usually these acrylic colors uh, compared to acrylic inks because they usually dry in a glossy way and they're kind of hard to babysit. The way that metallics work, I also have a video on that where I compare non-metallic metal and metallics. You still kind of want to use the matteness that uh, regular paint gives to create areas of uh, non-shine. And then you want to add another layer, a thin, very thin layer of metallics uh, to bring back some of these shiny areas. And yeah, you, you basically want to mimic lessons learned through non-metallic metal. Okay, Murder Manatees Ragnar. So this is obviously a large scale piece. And that means even though it's larger, it's going to catch a lot more natural light, but that doesn't mean you should not exaggerate. So you should still go for, first of all, good separation. Make sure that you don't have spill. And that scale is going to draw even more attention because we would expect a shadow here, a large shadow, because again, everything casts a shadow. Everything kind of should be separated. And then you just need to lean into textures. So first of all, I would increase the light on the face and maybe exaggerate some of the, the zones of the face, like the red below uh, the cheeks, because there's so, so much more blood flow and then the yellow on the forehead. Shoulders should catch a lot more light. It has chain mail, so that's a bit of a tricky choice for a miniature to paint. But if it has chain mail, you also need to define a chain mail. Um, I would try to pick out the eagle in some, some way, making it brighter, maybe. Also, you got to be careful with your eyes. So I don't know, it could be the sculpt. Maybe this size is a bit bigger than this one, but they look they look different. The wood itself looks really good. I say um, maybe you can work on the wood grain a bit more so that you have some detail. Um, metallics look good too, uh, good contrast in there, good texture. Uh, Super Tank did this thing Nico Galaxy release uh, and on first sight this looks a bit like it's an it's a glowing thing. The problem that I have with it is I don't think that was the intention. It's kind of an interesting effect right if we zoom out it looks like it's a glowing thing. And either I would have leaned into it by adding a slight tint, maybe a blue tint to it, 
towards the outside of this so that the inside uh, glows white and then you have that um, yeah blue on the outside and maybe having the blue bleed over onto these areas that uh, protrude outwards the the rubber of the the tire maybe being lit by that or you dirty up the white a bit so you have some parts where the red is shining through from below i would have just leaned into that and have this being scraped off or just being dirtied up by, by road dust or something like that. I mean, again, you would probably not have that much mechanical wear as you have here. And this is looks really good, by the way. Uh, maybe you don't want to do edge highlights all over the place, but just, just make these scratches a bit more consistent everywhere um, so that you have more contrast uh, if you don't want to place down an edge highlight. But yeah, as far as the white goes, maybe dirty it up, make it less consistently white. Um, up here you have some black showing, right? So maybe then it doesn't take center stage so much, which is kind of a pity because the rest of it is, is painted really nicely too. But the white just draws a lot of attention. Yeah, I like the, the chrome effect here. It looks really, really good. Maybe because it's chrome, w would you have some of the red reflecting? Um, it's not a criticism, just something to think about. Yeah, I like the rubber effect. Maybe you can, again, have more imperfections like you have here um, because, you know, it might roll over something and then it rips the tire a bit. Uh, just maybe using a sponge and, and dabbing on various shades of, of gray. I like the skin tones, I like the hair color. Yeah, the rest of it looks really solid. Uh, iteration X submitted this. I'm going to slap him around a bit because we have done feedback sessions for ages. I think he has a bit of a problem here. Can you guess it? I'll give you one second. So the problem that I have with this is that the sword looks really similar to the skin tones. If this was a statue that came to life, I can't believe it, but I don't have that backstory. So on first sight, kind of guessing what's the deal here. Also, I wish he would have done this white all on the rest of the swords. He has it here, uh, here, but he doesn't have it necessarily in the big reflections. I kind of get that maybe you want it a bit more up here, but the point is, Unless you're like standing in a cave and it's just a sliver of light coming from above that can reflect on, on the back of, of a sword, you still have really bright areas and swords. So maybe it will also help. And I guess that's the main point why I would add it, especially up here. But why I would go much brighter is to distinguish it from the skin a bit. And maybe what you can do is tint the metal a bit towards blue. I don't know, random blue I pick doesn't have to be the, the best solution. Just to separate it from the rest of the skin tones. Yeah, even though not fleshed out, immediately looks distinguishable, more distinguishable. And just add some of these brighter highlights um, just to really convey the idea of metal. Because I am a strong believer, even if it's a muted scene, muted light, that metal only shines if you push it all the way up to white, especially steel. Yeah, just checking for effect. We see it didn't do a perfect blend. And at the same time, I would try to make some of these parts more reflective. I am just sketching, not really blending, but for example, the way that light would hit up here, would probably have some areas that would be brighter. Yeah, just overall going for more contrast. Probably have some shadow from up here. And like that, you do have a muted light situation, but you still have some highlights, some yeah um, areas that make everything a bit more interesting, uh, that increase the contrast and make the scene look more alive. And again, with the overall muted tones, um, you can just add these tiny highlights or these small highlights and make the, the scene more effective and down here, depending on where the light source is coming from. You could even do like, super directional light by adding light like these and then it accumulates down here too um yeah so lots of way to make the scene a bit more dramatic uh, raven submitted this skeleton warrior that is a really nice piece really well composed super muted colors 
one thing that is a bit irritating is that the the pillar looks relatively similar to to the non-metallic metal, but ultimately there there is a bit of a difference, right? This is not as bright as this. Um, you could stain the pillar maybe in a bit of a different color, just to put it, put it apart from the more bluish um, silver on on the non-metallic metal. Uh, one tricky thing for a gold, it's always mm, not that advisable to go all the way to, to white. Uh, while it works, obviously, on, on the steel uh, metallics, I would stop at a, yeah, at a darker highlight color for the, for the gold. Uh, one more thing, um, so maybe a few more transitions in these parts, like here. All of these thick white highlights, well, they don't look bad, but uh, they could be more refined, I'd say. And then maybe simply because you have so much light in there, uh, it's not like this is a nighttime situation where all of the cloth would be as dark as it is. And I know that you probably don't want to draw that much attention, but I would I would make these a bit brighter in some areas, just you know some some highlights on there. And if you wanted to keep it more muted, uh, you could just maybe add some black to the colors towards the, the lower parts. Yeah, but overall, a limited palette, re really muted colors overall, nothing too in your face. Uh, really pleasing to look at. Right, so... Oh, uh, sorry, that's the doorbell. I'll be right back. What's up, pigment pushers? Trevarian here with yet another painting video. Did I do this correctly? Soon I can take over this channel. It's about time someone with a clue takes the wheel here. Anyway, keep slapping that paint bitches and remember you can't spell paint without pain. Get cracking. Sorry about that. 